Mayor, in three seconds, you're good to go. Good afternoon. It's Wednesday, February 3rd. I'm Mayor Jim Langfelder, City of Springfield, Illinois, and we appreciate you joining us for Facebook Live. Uh, we did have some time off, uh, mainly due to the holidays. Uh, we thought it was important people refocus on their families and what's important in life. And then uh, started back up. Uh, we are in the midst of our budget season and moving in that direction. That's going well. Um, actually, tomorrow we have at 530, which you can uh, view on YouTube, I believe, is our CWLP and Office of Planning and Economic Development uh, budget discussions, as well as uh, you can access that through our cable access network, which is uh, channel 18. But we appreciate you joining us today. And before I introduce, uh, reintroduce uh, Chief Kenny Winslow and the uh, new uh, person in the uh, command level of the city is uh, the newly uh, approved Chief Brandon Blau. Uh, I will go through a few items real quick. Uh, with regards to mitigations, we really appreciate everybody's diligence in wearing their masks. I think that's been the game changer. You know, it's been, uh, we're, uh, probably one of the, we are the first city to have a stringent of uh, Im implementation of the mask where an individual could be fined for not wearing it as well as uh, businesses, but everybody stepped up and it's really helped mitigate not only the COVID coronavirus and our numbers locally, but also the flu. I've understood that uh, flu uh, are way down and that's due to people wearing their masks, staying diligent with regards to that. So the three W's, as we all know, is wear your mask, watch your social distance, which is six feet between people, and then uh, wash your hands as frequently as possible and we'll get through this. Uh, with regards to, as we move forward, uh, we are in phase four now. We were reopened. Uh, actually, prior to us reopening, restaurants were shut down to indoor services, bars as well. Now they're back open. The bars are restricted to 1 a.m. Uh, but the restaurants are back open. Uh, what's different in Springfield is you cannot uh, wait inside unless there's a seat you can wait at. Uh, you still have to have that separation and wear your mask until you're at your seated table to enjoy your meal. Um, in the meantime, you'd either have to you know, stand outside or wait in your car and then be notified that you can be uh, ushered to your table directly with regards to restaurants. Now in the bars, if you ever go to places like that, uh, there's no, uh, you know, open space. Uh, what we do have is you have to wear your mask when you're uh, moving from place to place uh, at any location. But the uh, there's no common area. You have to be seated or standing at a table. And that's the main difference. And we want to stay uh, vigilant with regards to the virus and mitigating the spread uh, so we can retain our business being open and moving that direction. The other uh, game changer, as we all know, is the vaccines now. Uh, Sangamon County Public Health. Uh, everybody, you know, there's great demand and we appreciate everybody's patience in that. Uh, as with any product, you know, with vaccines, there's a high demand for people that want the vaccines and need the vaccines. Uh, but just like anything, if you have high demand and low volume, it's going to create a bottleneck and uh, just a, a propensity of calls coming in. So really, my advice would be uh, check with your primary care physician and ask them about the vaccine. And then if you do not have a primary care physician uh, or if they direct you, then you would call Sangamon County Department of Public Health because they are uh, bombarded as we know. Uh, we are into 1B on the vaccination chart, which are individuals over the age of 65. And then also essential workers uh, expanded that uh, to include grocery store workers, uh, individuals uh, in the healthcare profession, of course, and first responders. Um, and move in that uh, low direction. On our chat, we will have uh, individuals that want to chat in their questions. They can do so, and we'll answer those, intertwine them in our discussion. But the other thing is we'll give you, uh, you can go on the Illinois Department of Public Health website or go to springfield.il.us. We'll have a link on our COVID page where you can actually uh, link into the Department of Public Health website, and they do have a locator address for vaccines. So it's real easy. You just uh, click on it and then you enter your zip code and it'll pop up the different locations, whether it's Walgreens or Hy-Vee or 
Department of Public Health or hospital where you could possibly get a vaccine. But again, you'll have to contact that entity directly to uh, make arrangements because they are taking schedules uh, associated with that. But today I'm uh, happy to uh, shift gears a little bit to talk about uh, the pandemic and what it's meant to each department, but most importantly, how they've uh, uh, each department with our police department and fire department ushered through this and how we project ourselves uh, serving the public to a greater scale post pandemic, because that's what it's all about. What do we do after post pandemic? What have we learned and how do we improve those services as we move forward? So um, first I will uh, introduce uh, Chief Winslow. And the main reason I, you know, I always say this, uh, take no offense, Chief Blau, but the police department's my favorite department because they, uh, you know, they're out there every day and night, uh, you know, they don't know what they're walking into. And it, uh, it's, uh, you know, just extreme circumstances, uh, life and death at times. And uh, the fire department has that to a degree, but not to the level that the police department has. But then uh, Chief, Win uh, Chief Lau can see how Chief Winslow does and take some pointers as I do his introduction. But uh, we are represented by two great uh, individuals that represent the city of Springfield well, uh, and they understand the importance of service. And it, for us, or for myself, it all goes back to the main model, Abraham Lincoln, it's government of the people, by the people, for the people, and providing that service to our residents and people that visit here. But Chief Winslow, uh, He's uh, been at the helm, I think, now for probably uh, eight years, possibly, uh, seven or eight years. He can let us know that. But uh, we appreciate him still being here. And I did uh, retain him, and I'm thankful for that. And the main reason, uh, you know, he did a, a great job through this trying time we've been through, but also prior to that, uh, showing the new direction of the police department, how we need to be engaged. Uh, but after the pandemic, it's going to be a new way of doing business, so to speak. And uh, Chief Winslow understands the importance of engagement, community engagement. And really, it comes down to compassion and understanding. You have to understand uh, the position other people are in and try to help them through those difficult situations. And um, Chief Winslow, for every uh, length of time we have him, he will be able to, uh, of course, uh, create that culture within the police department, especially the higher ranks, and uh, really uh, move us in that new direction that we need to take and take collectively. So, Chief, if you'd like to say a few words and introduction and uh, whatever you'd like to share uh, with regards to the status right now, and then we'll dive into questions and answers in greater detail as we move along. So, Chief Winslow. Thank you, boss. Uh Thanks for the kind words. And Randy, you heard we're the favorite department. You heard that, right? Just put your wrong <laughs> <in your face. laughs> no, uh, you know, law enforcement in 2020 uh, was a challenging year, probably one of the most challenging years that I've ever seen in my career. And uh, having been a police officer, start my 27th year. I'm in my 27th year now and my soon to be, you know, I'll complete eight years as chief in July. So it's been, it's been a challenge and it's been a rewarding and uh, a fulfilling career. And I'm grateful and honored to have the opportunity to serve the citizens of the community and lead this great agency. With that said, you know, uh, 2020 represented a lot of challenges for us. You know, when we talk about the gun violence that we've seen through across the country, uh, the city of Springfield is not immune to it and what we've seen there. And then uh, the, the civil unrest we saw over the summer and, uh, you know, the ability to see peaceful protest in our community for the most part is a, a testament to the citizens of our community and the great work of the men and women of the police department, but also those who were organizers of those events. Um, we saw the Bun incident last year that stressed our, uh, our community and uh, caused community-wide pain for everybody. Uh, the senseless killings and the, the shots fires that we've seen over the year and the, just the normal, uh, I won't say normal, but the, the increase in crime violent crime that we saw across our country as a whole and the things we're trying to do this year as we go forward and then how COVID impacted those efforts as well as our community engagement, community outreach and how those were impacted by that. And hopefully as we move down the road of hopefully getting the majority of the community vaccinated, we can get back to some of those things and continue to adapt and move forward. Uh, not to mention the fiscal constraints that the city and the department's been under uh, with the current hiring freeze and trying to do more with less and just uh, maintain uh, a, a quality level of service by restructuring the department to 12 hour days uh, to put more people on the street to better serve the community. Uh, and those are the sacrifices that the men and women of the police department done. Those were sacrifices that impact their personal lives and not everybody's happy about it, but ultimately uh, 
you know, it's things that we have to do what's best for the community during these uncertain times right now. Well, thank you, Chief. I uh, appreciate you taking the time and your uh, service to our uh, community. And next is uh, Chief Brandon Blau. Uh, he um, succeeds uh, Chief Alan Riney, and uh, we really appreciate Chief Riney uh, ushering through this difficult time. He had the task of actually uh, doing the incident command team with Sangamon County Department of Public Health and help set up that whole structure. And the reason I assigned the fire department uh, over there as the representation for the city of Springfield, uh, along with uh, Chief Winslow, of course, participated, is because one, you want the professionals uh, at the helm. You don't want a, necessarily a politician, uh, you know, kind of uh, calling the shots at that level. Really, you need the hierarchy chart of a, um, almost like a militaristic uh, standpoint where you're, you have tasks to take care of and you, uh, implement those and Chief Riney did a great job in that uh, role. And, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately the grass was a little greener on the other side and he went off and retired, but uh, I interviewed uh, Chief Brandon Blau as, as well as others, but uh, Chief Blau has been with the department. I'll let him give his background if, uh, if you would, please. But the reasons why I chose him is one, he's uh, outspoken, you know, he'll, uh, you know, he'll share his opinion, which I really appreciate because I don't want someone that's just going to be a yes person uh, for the mayor. That's not what it's about. It's how do we come with the best solutions possible to serve the public. And so he doesn't uh, um, shy away from, uh, you know, uh, his beliefs and uh, doesn't shy away from his commitment to serve the public and whatever that takes, he'll fulfill it. And we really appreciate his uh, endeavor with that, but also uh, his demeanor with how he handles the public. He's a personal individual. He takes things to heart. And uh, that goes a long way when you're trying to serve the public and gain a true understanding of what uh, will help a particular situation. So uh, Chief uh, Brandon Blau, we really appreciate you taking on the, uh, the reins of being chief, especially during this very challenging time that you're in. As we know, we went through a quarantine period of up to 70 firefighters at the time and uh, gone through that. And then you came in after that and, um, you know, we'll talk about some of the implementation things, but if you would introduce yourself to the uh, public, uh, we were, we were, would really appreciate it. Thanks mayor uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, I am Brandon Blau. I'm uh, from Springfield, born and raised here. I attended the university of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I went to Ursuline, which is now closed. Um, but there's still a lot of us in the area. Uh, my father and my uncle were both uh, on the fire department, retired after 27 uh, years apiece, I believe. Uh, I've always told the joke that my, my dad retired from the fire department six months before I started. And during those six months, fire department ran like a Swiss watch because there weren't any blows involved. But uh, so I started way back in the 1900s. I started in September of 1999. Uh, Chief Ryan, who was my predecessor, who did a fantastic job as being our liaison uh, with the county as far as heading up all of our, our COVID response and how we've had to uh, have some interdepartmental uh, politics and all the things that go along with that, but making sure that everybody goes in the same direction uh, to keep our, our citizenry safe. Uh, but he did a great job with that. Uh, and he decided to leave at the end of the year. Um, I was able to uh, answer the call and this has been uh, what my goal was to, uh, when I joined the fire department, uh, I, I think yeah, I have an opportunity to lead one of the finest fire departments uh, in the country. We're a class one department. Uh, don't plan on changing that. Uh, we want to keep the momentum going. We have fine men, men and women uh, that I'm, I, I have the opportunity to lead. Um, we did step in. I did step in in kind of a difficult time. Um, the good part about that is we know it's going to get better. Um, and we've made strides. I, I, I think that we, have, as a community and as a country, have, have turned the corner. Uh, and I look forward to continuing to face the challenges that that we've been able to uh, that we've been able to face this far. Well, thank you, Brandon. We really appreciate you taking the time. And one of the things that you implemented uh, quickly is kind of in midstream, I believe, when you came on, was our partnership with the University of Illinois Springfield and the uh, saliva testing. Um, 
real quick. Most people are uh, familiar with the test where you go to maybe the hospital, the Walgreens, or your uh, primary care physician or public health, and you do the nose, uh, you know, the uh, Q-tip or whatever you call it, uh, up the nose. Uh, that's one way to take the test, which is it identifies if you, whether or not you have COVID. Uh, what we've done with the University of Illinois Springfield is what they call the saliva test. Same thing they use at U of I. Uh, because you have a large population of students there, and they want to uh, test more often, more frequently, to try to identify as quickly as possible someone that might be asymptomatic or have COVID, and then you can isolate them quickly so they don't infect a lot of other individuals. Uh, the reason we went this direction with the uh, fire department is, as I mentioned at the top of the program, that we had uh, 70 quarantined at one time because of the spread, because uh, the fire department, you know, they, uh, you know, they're on 24 hours, so they're sharing a lot of time in close quarters together. And uh, by doing the saliva test uh, with the University of Illinois Springfield, we could uh, wrap our arms around it in that direction to uh, catch it prior to someone going into that setup and infecting others. So, uh, Chief Lau, if you would uh, bring us up to speed on uh, how that's going, and also on the vaccination front, if you'd. Uh, talk about both of those and how they're working collectively together, if you would, please. Sure. The, uh, you're exactly right. The, the saliva test allows us to test all of our people each week or almost all of our people. You know, we have people that are off on vacation time or uh, they're sick or, or whatever it is. But uh, basically everybody who's on shift on Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays head out to UIS uh, it's a, a little easier test because all you have to do is, is do the saliva test. They, they ask you to, to spit in the tube and then you hand that off. I've done it personally, I think three or four times already. Um, when I go in there, they have it down. It's, they have it, it is very efficient. We walk in, I'm usually in and out in less than five minutes. Um, our people are the same way and we just, we just schedule those uh, those uh, apparatus, our, our engines and our trucks and our battalion cars uh, at different times during the day to go out there and uh, let our people do the testing. And what it does is uh, catches the people who are asymptomatic that may not understand that they have it. Because uh, as most, of, most people know by now that COVID has a very wide berth as far as uh, the, the way that it affects people. Some people obviously, um, you know, it, they have significant issues and obviously, it, it, you know, it, it, it's deadly for some. Some people never know they walk around for, you know, 10 days or better, not knowing that they ever even had it. They have no symptoms whatsoever. Um, so what this does is it helps us to catch those people because I think that that's where when we did have uh, the big uptick on the fire department where we had a lot of people uh, exposed and a lot of people sick. Uh, a lot of them didn't know they had it and that's and that's how it, it got spread. You know, there's lots of stories out there, but we're, we're extremely confident that most of it was just guys coming to work, people coming to work, not knowing that they had it, interacting uh, the way that they usually do. And, you know, at the time we were doing the social distancing and wearing the masks, but I'm here to tell you, you know, there's nothing that uh, that is a hundred percent, you know, so you can, you can take all of the precautions that are out there. And sometimes one of, uh, some of the virus just slips through. So, but our people, we did, we had a, we had a major uptick and, and uh, had to deal with that. And we, we got with the mayor's office and, and, and UIS and we're able to formulate a plan to try and keep our people safe. And what people don't think about either, you know, sometimes is, is that we have to keep our people safe because they interact with the community. And the last thing that uh, the, the men and women of the fire department want to do is come into work and, and you're there to, to help your community, to try and keep them safe. Last thing that they want to do is, is go in and pass this on and make somebody sick. So uh, it's been a great tool so far. We had 60 people uh, mm -hmm. yesterday that tested uh, out at UIS and we had zero positives, which is great. We hope that that number stays the same. Um, we're gonna have 60 people or so today. I'm gonna go in today. Um, I like to make sure that that I don't have it and pass it on to you know, the people that I work with or the people that, that I love. So, um, so we do that. And then in conjunction with that, um, we had uh, 
the people that work for us that on the on the rigs uh, that do a great job. Uh, we have about 70% of the fire department that volunteered to do the vaccinations as well, which is great. Um, we already had uh, a, a pretty good, we had several people who had already contracted uh, COVID. And so they have uh, some level of immunity uh, that, that chose not to get tet or not to get vaccinated. Um, but combined between the people who have already had it and the people who are getting vaccinated, we're going to be around 90% of our, of our department that's, that should be uh, immune, have, have a, a pretty good immunity to, uh, to COVID. But um, we get our second round. We send everybody for our second round of the vaccination shots uh, starting next week. So by within the next three weeks or so, we'll have some people that have had that 14 day time period uh, where they say that uh, you need to wait before you're, you're truly at the height of your immunity. Um, but in, in about three weeks, we ought to, we ought to have a really good uh, group of people that, that, are, that are there at that point. Well, that's a great uh, synopsis. And what it shows is uh, with the saliva test and uh, well, people unfortunately hadn't been infected. And then you have the vaccine, the combination of all that uh, will assure that uh, we won't fall into the same situation we had before, but we're reaching the, uh, within the department, fire department, we're reaching the point of herd immunity uh, when the vaccinations take hold, which uh, we, everybody wants to be at that point, uh, but the first responders, rightfully so, should be at the front of the line so they can protect us uh, each and every day uh, that we count on. But regardless of the vaccination, we still have to wear our masks and things of that nature um, just to as an added precautionary measure. Because the one thing this pandemic has taught us is that it's, uh, it's changing each and every day. You have new variants coming. Uh, I think there's like three or four different variants right now. So it's really taking, it's not, I'm not saying it's the flu, it's like the flu, where the flu, when it first started out, you just had one strand, that now you have multiple different strands. COVID's taking that same pathway where now you're having multiple different uh, types of COVID. And I've said this uh, months before, uh, I'm a true believer that you'll get your flu shot and then you'll start getting a COVID shot each and every year. I think that's going to be the uh, new uh, reality of all of this, but time will tell. But again, it is, uh, it's fluid in nature. We're trying to address it as best as we can, but the best line of defense, uh, of course, the shot, but uh, wearing your mask before you get the shot after, and after you get the shot. So with that, uh, appreciate your pushing that saliva testing and the vaccinations and moving that direction. Uh, Chief Winslow, same thing. If you would uh, give an update on the fire department, or I'm sorry, the police department with regards to that, um, how things stand and how you've been able to handle these uh, difficult challenges with staffing and uh, providing uh, that level of service. And I know you've taken a change of hours and shifts that came up and for a brief discussion, maybe you want to expound upon that as well. Yeah, starting off with the COVID, uh, obviously we had to change our policies and procedures and how we respond to calls for service uh, early on in the pandemic because we just didn't know a lot about it. And since that time, we've been able to modify those procedures. You know, right now, officers are still required to wear masks when they're out on the call interacting with the public. It's something that's just vitally important. Obviously, we're just like the public, we actually do proper hygiene, that kind of thing. Um, you know, a lot of our calls for service are not getting a police officer sent to them anymore. We're doing a lot of that remotely. We're in the process of even uh, implementing an online reporting process in the next budget year uh, to, to take care of that, make it a little more efficient as well. But officers are calling and they're trying to get as much information via phone before they get out with somebody to limit that time and that contact there. Uh, additionally, you know, when it comes to the COVID thing, uh, we've told our officers the vast majority want to get vaccinated. Uh, we are still in the early process of vaccination. I think right now we're at 43% of our department that has their first shot. No one has their second shot yet. Uh, every day, public health calls us with whatever amount they have available for our officers and we send them over there to get vaccinated, you know, and again, the goal is to get that herd immunity eventually. Um, but again, you know, it's one of those things that we still have to keep our uh, appropriate safety measures in place after the vaccination. So those are things we're looking at on that front. Um, while we didn't have the big outbreak that the fire department has had, we have had people on a weekly basis that go down with COVID or they have to be quarantined because a family member has COVID. So it has impacted our services. It has also impacted our budget over the year. But we've been able to cut in other places to try to minimize that fiscal impact on the community and the taxpayers. 
the biggest thing for us, obviously, is back last summer when you asked us to uh, look at ways to save money because of the unknown fiscal impact of COVID was the, uh, the hiring freeze that we underwent last September and they're currently under. And right now we have 23 openings on our department. Now this doesn't count people who are activated in the military and gone. This doesn't count that uh, uh, people who are out injured, uh, who may be on workers comp or other medical related uh, leaves. So, you know, right now we're running about 15% below our manpower. I anticipate that growing to about 20% here by June uh, with anticipated additional retirements that are forthcoming. So when we looked down the road and we saw what was coming, we had to look at how could we deploy our manpower the best we possibly could. We could stay on the current rotation that we used to be on, which was a five day work week, nine hour days with three days off, or we could look at alternatives. And if we stayed on the five and three, there were gonna be sacrifices. We were have to look at specialty units and cutting those, such as our neighborhood police officers, our narcotics unit, our street crimes unit. Uh, our detective bureaus are already running low. Um, you know, you just don't have as many bodies to go around. So we had to look at what could we do while maintaining uh, uh, a quality of service for our community that we think they deserve. So we met with our union leadership and we came to an agreement between the leadership, the city's legal department and the PD to come up with 12 hour days as a pilot program for the first six months of this year. Uh, while it's not ideal for everybody, it has an impact on everybody. Uh, there's been sacrifices by our officers. Uh, to make this work, we had to look at what was best for the community. We had to look at how can we get the most officers on the streets to provide those service at any given time, especially during our high call volume times. And that's what this 12 hour shift allows us to do right now. Are there kinks and issues with it? Absolutely. Are there things that are not ideal? Absolutely. Are there people who don't like it? Absolutely. So as we go forward though, we have to keep the big picture and the big picture is when it comes to police and law enforcement, we are here to serve and protect and we have to provide that service and we provide services through people. So we have to have that. And I'm thankful to the leadership of the PVPA for working with us on this. I'm thankful to the men and women who have made sacrifices. Uh, you know, and when people talk about sacrifice, you're on a 12 hour day. If you're on that late shift that works 7P to 7A or 630P to 630, I should say, you don't have a lot of time with your kids when they get home from school. They get home 430. You don't have a lot of time to spend with them. It's a sacrifice, you know, and uh, there are some pros to it and there are some cons to it. There's some benefits for your officers as well to get every other weekend off or before they got a weekend every five or six weeks. So there are some benefits there, but it's something that's changed, is different. We'll evaluate it in May to see how it's going and whether we're going to continue on it or if we're going to try to look at something different. But that's pretty much it about the 12 hour days that allowed us to maintain those levels of services to include, you know, those specialty units without having to take away neighborhood police officers, without having to take people out of undercover capacities to battle the uh, the drug issues we have and the gang issues and the gun violence and uh, the uh, federal resources that we have. We have officers who are assigned to task forces with the uh, FBI for the Safe Streets program. We did a big round up here back in December where we took 20 known gang members off the street, and that was the result of the a cooperative investigation with the federal levels and having that benefit of having officer science at task force helped us there along with the uh, cooperation of our undercover narcotics unit to help work that in that that detail. Um, gun violence, you know, that's another big issue this year. We've seen it across the country. We've seen it here. You know, uh, I, you know, I've been on calls with chiefs at comparable cities here in Illinois, as well as around the country on what are we going to do about it. Springfield's not immune. When I look at Chicago, I had almost 800 homicides last year and the increase that they had versus the increase we had, we went from nine to 11 homicides. And if you include the three that occurred at Bunn, it kind of skews it a little bit. Uh, you know, obviously that was one incident, but three homicides. Um, we're not immune from it. As far as shooting victims, you know, we went from 46 shooting victims last year, I believe to 53 or 54. I don't have the stats right in front of me this year. So we did see an increase there. Um, but we're battling and doing everything we can to address this and hold people accountable. People ask, well, what are you doing about it? You know, uh, if I could stop crime, you know, I would, obviously they would around the country. It is something you can't stop, but what we can do is we can uh, vigorously investigate it, try to hold those people accountable that do it, arrest them, and then try to prevent, you know, a lot of the issues we were seeing when it comes to our shootings are not random uh, shots fired. They're not random victims. They are those who participate in at-risk behavior. They are gang members who are uh, combating with each other. Uh, they have no regard for the value of life or the safety of the people in our community. And we're going to hold them responsible. And we're working with our federal law enforcement partners to do that. Uh, when I said earlier that we 
made a roundup of 20. Those That will not be the only roundup this year. We are currently working on others that will be forthcoming. Uh, we are trying to be more uh, transparent about the arrests we make. Usually we don't put a lot of arrests out that we make. Uh, we let it run through the court system, but we're going to start putting out there a few more of these arrests that we make for these gun violations. I personally believe that, you know, when somebody is caught carrying a gun illegally, there should be a, uh, a penalty for that. And that penalty should involve time served. And that's just not the way the system we have right now. It's a probationable offense. Uh, the reason I say time served is because your one argument, your one Snapchat, your one social media interaction away from pulling the trigger and ruining somebody's life as well as your own. So I think there should be a, a stiff penalty. But unfortunately, we live in a system that uh, believes in second, third, fourth, and fifth chances. And while I do believe in redemption, there has to be accountability for your actions. And when you're recklessly endangering the public, we have to be stronger on that. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the new police reform act and cash bail and no cash bail and all that stuff. You know, I'm hoping that, you know, judges will have the authority to hold people accountable for their actions. I personally don't believe that anybody that sh shoots a gun at somebody should get a bond. They should all, there should be no cash bond. I agree with that. They should all have to sit in jail until their court time comes, you know? So again, you know, I, I believe in protecting our community and protecting people we have out there, but gun violence is a complex issue. When you look at professionals, you talk to the professionals, they talk about how economics plays a role. They talk about how mental health, trauma, all that plays a role. It's not an easy thing to do. You know, uh, at the police department, you know, we're trying to do things through our focus deterrence program to provide those services, whether it's mental health, social services, uh, mentorship, those kind of things to try to get involved, change these kids' life at a younger age. Uh, the group of people who are out here doing the shooting are typically, you know, the 16 to 25, 26 year range. That's what we're really dealing with. Um, we're also dealing with people who, like I said earlier, they're, they're on their third and fourth chance. They're out on parole. They're out on probation uh, because the first time around, they didn't get any time. So we are dealing with those issues as we move forward. Uh, you know, I can tell you that the men and women of the Springfield Police Department every day work hard trying to identify those people that are involved in this violence. What we need from the community here is their assistance because the victims and the suspects in these types of crime are not cooperating. They're not going to tell you who did it. They're not going to tell you who shot at them. They'll just rather handle it themselves. So what we need from the victim or from the community is, you know, if you see something, say something. Be that witness. Please get involved. Uh, point us in the right direction. Um, additionally, you know, register your security cameras so we know where they're at, so we can look at that, whether that's through the Ring Neighbors app or whether that's through our own private portal that we have on our website. There's things we can do there. Uh, you know your neighborhood better than anybody. Landlords, when my neighborhood police officers come to you and they tell you that there's a problem at a residence and we show you the evidence of a problem, do the right thing, evict them, remove them from the neighborhood. You know, they can go to Jacksonville, they can go to Decatur to live if they want, as far as I'm concerned. We don't want criminal element. Uh oh. So <laughs> I'm going to get the calls from Decatur mayor and the Jacksonville mayor now. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I think you're, you hit the point. It's, uh, uh, we need greater community engagement without a doubt. And, um, the issues that uh, raised, I mean, with the pandemic, it's, it's, it's just not the illness uh, itself, but it's the ramifications of the illness with the isolation happening. I think um, we talked previously about school, you know, now you have 186 in, only half the students are there, while the other half are on the streets. And that's what we need to be proactive about is how do we, uh, uh, especially our children, keep them engaged in positive actions and so we don't lose them to the streets and that's uh the challenge for all of us to move in that direction but one question we did have coming in but going back to uh the pandemic real quick is uh vaccinations do you know um how many uh are set to that have had vaccinations within the police department uh, percentage wise and how many are will do the vaccinations when it's all said and done and then i'll pose the same question to uh, chief lao as well yeah, as of last Friday, we had 43% of our department who had received their first round of vaccination. Um, initially, when we put out the survey of who wanted to be vaccinated, we were floating around at 50%. Uh, but as more people have seen that people haven't had an adverse reaction to the vaccination, they're stepping forward and wanting them as well. So um, I don't have a final number of who wants them right now in front of me, but I would anticipate by the time it's over and said and over and done, we'll, we'll probably be like Brandon between the uh, People who have had it and the people who want the vaccination will probably be floating around at 90% is what I would anticipate. 
And then Chief, I think uh, Chief Blau, I think you uh, had expressed that, but anything you want to add? Um, right now, how many actually had the vaccination so far? I think we originally numbers signed, wise. We we originally signed up about uh, about two thirds of the department, and I think that after it was all said and done, we had some people who uh, had a change of heart, and I think we ended up right mm -hmm. around seventy percent. So that's about a hundred and. 40 to you know 140 people or more that that have gone through the first round um oh. and we're we're gonna get the rest of those through the second round next week hopefully well that's good and then uh, the uh one aspect uh, that i'd like both of you to touch on real quick is uh with regards to the budget you know we're going through that right now and I won't. I don't want you to belabor it, but I guess uh, if you'd point some of the highlights or what you hope uh, would be the initiatives. Uh, you know, we all know we have to staff uh, the particular departments. But what initiatives will um, do you believe will be a change of how you provide service or improve service to the public? So I'd, I'd either chief. I don't know, Brandon, if you want to go ahead and go first, because you know the easy one is, of course, we do have in the budget about three new stations and why that's important and. Uh, anything you'd like to add with regards to that? That's what I was going to talk about. You took it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, we have uh, we have three new stations uh, that we'd like to build in the upcoming year. I'm working right now to uh, identify uh, exactly the areas where we want to put those stations uh, and look at some designs and some architects and whatnot. Uh, one of the stations is, is Station 6, which was recently kind of cut off uh, by the, the rail project, so it makes, makes it harder for, for our people that work at 6 to get to where they need to go because, because they've kind of, they did the underpass there on Ash, and it just complicates matters over there. Um, and then the other uh, two stations that we're looking at are is Station 4, which is at 19th and Converse. Uh, on the northeast, and um, we're looking at possibly moving that a little bit further east, uh, and, and so we can get to that commercial corridor that's in the in the e northeast corner of the city there, where uh, Lowe's and Walmart and all of that has had such growth over the last decade or so. Uh, we'd like to to move it so that we can get to those places a little faster. And the other one is eight. Um, eight is the one that's on uh, Monroe and Chatham Road. And uh, we have an opportunity possibly there to move that one a little bit further west, um, get away from the congestion that sometimes is caused by uh, the, the uh, Starbucks that's next door. That place just goes like gangbusters. And there's a lot of times that creates a little bit of congestion in that, in that uh, particular area. So uh, that would help us there. Um, but we're gonna look at the other engine houses too. We have. Uh, some aging infrastructure that needs attention. Um, we have some some uh, rigs that we'd like to to replace that we think that we're going to get accomplished this year. And then we have an opportunity. Uh, we have the the uh, contract negotiations with uh, the, the local this year. So you know we want to see what we can do there to to come to some agreements and and make life better for the people that we serve as well as the people who work with us. Yeah, and as you move forward, uh, do you see any uh, modernization as far as, you know, with technology or how, uh, is there anything on the forefront uh, that might be coming down the pipe with regards to uh, combating fires or EMS services? I know there's a great escalation of EMS service, especially during the pandemic, uh, if you'd like to touch on that real quick. Sure. Um, we are looking at expanding our uh traffic preemption system that we started uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, basically the, the traffic preemption uh, system that we put in on the Southwest corridor, uh, basically all it does is it turns red lights green. When, when we come to intersections that have red lights, um, there is a, a radio mechanism that, that connects with the, the uh, traffic signals that change those those signals from, from red to green, which allows the traffic ahead of us to move through that, which, which makes it safer for everybody. Because on the when you come up to an intersection that doesn't have that, obviously, everybody's been sitting at a red light before and had a fire truck or, or a police car or an ambulance come up behind it. And people tend to panic 
they don't you, they don't know exactly what to do. They know they're supposed to turn right, but they're sitting at a red light. What am I supposed to do now to get out of the way? By turning that red light green, uh, it makes it safer for everybody, and we get through that. We have three more phases that we'd like to in, implement over the next year or two uh, around the city that will improve our response times, but it also helps keep our people and all of the the people the the community that are that are out there driving on the roads as well it keeps them safe so uh we're looking at that and actually we just started and i don't think i've even talked to you about this mayor but uh no breaking news of uh, breaking news uh we also ha uh, have uh some a drone coming we have a we've a uh, foreign fire board has purchased a bo uh, a drone uh that'll be helpful for uh you know sometimes getting a bird's eye view no pun intended on on a fire can help you and find out where where your problems are something that you can't see normally from the ground you know it also can help on on things like searches for uh you know if you have lost children or if you have some type of a, a silver alert or something like that where you where you need help it has a uh, it has infrared on it so it can see body heat uh so mm -hmm. we're, we're in the midst of trying to uh, put together a team for that uh bryce mccormick is is one of the people one of our young people that uh, is doing a really good job with uh, trying to get that into place. He's also our hazmat guy. So, um, but yeah, that's those are a couple of pieces of technology that we're looking to put into place that I think will make the fire department better and the community better. Yeah, they, um, you know, you've been in the job for what, uh, how long? Six months, maybe? Not even that long, has it? 13 years. No, uh, no I mean, I, I think <laughs> it seems like 13 years. Yeah, um, that's good. I like it. Yeah, uh, I think it's been about six weeks, eight weeks, something like that. Six weeks, yep, yep. And now you want up to Chief because uh, Chief Winslow always wanted a drone. He has drone envy, <laughs> and I think I don't think he has one yet. But uh, Chief uh, Winslow, if you would like to uh, speak about the uh, as you go forward, uh, you know, with the budget, of course, if you want to touch on anything, highlight. But uh, providing service and uh, the use of technology as you move forward uh, post pandemic, what that uh, you think that direction might be. Yes, sir. No problem. First off, uh, Brandon, congratulations on the drone. I think that's a great shared service <laughs> you're going to have there. We'll be more than happy to throw a couple members to your team and help you out there for that shared service. That's a great way to marriage voice. Mm -hmm. express. That's okay. right. I'm, I'm sure you will. <laughs> no, uh, uh, speaking of drones, you know, I mean, again, I think, valuable, especially in the uh, missing persons uh, situation, they'd be helpful for us a lot. And there's some other work situations that could be helpful. So I think it is a great technology that's out there. Uh, as far as us with technology next year, you know, obviously this was a flat budget, but one thing we are moving toward and it should be up and going here probably by early summer is our online reporting system. I kind of hit about that a little bit earlier. We are looking forward to that as a way to, again, uh, just another option for community members to make reports for uh, the types of reports where maybe they don't have uh, any kind of evidence other than maybe some damage, but no suspect information. But we're looking for a system that you can upload video, you can upload photos to, as well as the report, and there'll still be some engagement well, with the supervisor who will be approving the reports, but it's just another option that's out there. Uh, things I'm kind of looking forward to this year in the budget that really don't cost a lot of money, but it's how we deliver service, you know, is getting back to more of that community policing post pandemic, getting more to that community engagement factor, the things we couldn't do. Uh, community education is so important, whether it's through our Citizen Police Academy, our Junior Police Academy, our Teen Academy or just even just community meetings and community forums, that kind of thing, kind of talking about things out there. Uh, our country is so divided right now, and one way that we have to come together is we have to bring the community together as a whole and have those conversations. It's difficult in the pandemic, and everybody wants to be safe, but that's one of the things I look forward to. Um, you know, the additional training, you know, that we do. Uh, training's been an adaptation. You know, we've done some training, embracing technology, smaller class sizes, that kind of thing, but getting back to where we can have some more of those scenario-based trainings uh, continue our involvement in training. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about de-escalation training. The Springfield Police Department's been doing de-escalation de training for years. Uh, and uh, we're a leader in the community, in the department, in the state when it comes to, you know, the type of training that's performed. So we're fortunate that we have our in-house trainers. We can send them out to get trained. They can bring that training back. A lot of departments don't have that. We have to depend on the mobile training units. And the mobile training units have not been funded uh, for over a year now. Uh, the only classes they've offered are grant funding classes, grant funded classes, you know, because of the state budget issues. So we've been able to maintain our training because of those reasons. 
Uh, one thing I'm really excited about, and this goes back to our gun violence reduction initiatives, is the uh, United States Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Bureau has embedded an agent in the Springfield Police Department. Uh, they now work hand in hand uh, with my detectives and my street crimes unit on gun violence. Uh, that was something we had asked for and came about late last year. Um, so that's been a, that's, I think that's going to pay dividends as we move forward. And when we talked about the, you know, the openings and stuff right now that we have in the vacancies, that's also an opportunity to diversify the department as we go forward too. So we've been doing a lot of interviews here lately. Uh, I'm proud of the diversification that we've brought to the department, but this will give us an opportunity. There's not too many years where you're going to hire 20 people uh, or more to, uh, to try to increase that diversity within our ranks. Uh, so those are the kind of things I'm looking forward to. Uh, obviously, I know the officers are looking forward to it as well as far as uh, getting back to the full strength eventually, and that would be something that would be beneficial. But for us, to premise the budget this year was a status quo, flat budget. Uh, but I look forward to getting back and returning to some of the more uh, proactive measures we take in policing that we had to kind of curtail because of COVID. Yeah, the one of the things that uh, I'll touch upon is uh, more the understanding part, um, you know, with uh, what we want to do is be reflective of our community, of course, and moving that direction. One of the items that did come up in the city council recently was the uh, blue line and the flag uh, that's on, you know, some of the police cars and then the apparel, things of that nature. And um, unfortunately, tragically, uh, when you have individuals use it uh, not for intended purposes, I'm speaking specifically of the blue line on the uh, flag, and you can speak to it from the police standpoint, is used at the Capitol attack, you know, when they uh, storm the Capitol building and they use the American flag. And then, of course, this flag, uh, and it's, uh, it, it creates uh, ill uh, thoughts with regards to that bad representation. That's not what that means. But if you would touch on that, because I know there's been uh, some concern on, um, you know, when you're talking about uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, that is a... Uh, an initiative that came forward and it really didn't dawn on, I didn't understand it until uh, I've actually listened uh, to uh, minorities, um, black individuals, uh, and it really struck home during the pandemic when I was watching the news and a lady was talking about a situation she occurred as during the George Floyd and the Breonna Taylor situation. And she said, you know, she had her a uh, 20 year old son, or he was a teenager, I think he left his bag, his book bag at the restaurant. And she told him to run back to the restaurant and get your bag. And so uh, her teenage son, black son starts running towards the restaurant and she just yells, stop. And she, she realized uh, what a, the, the visual or the, I guess the apparent reaction a lot of people may have, or some people may have was seeing a black man running and uh, just thinking uh, bad thoughts, where if it's a white person, uh, you wouldn't have those thoughts. And I think that's really, it really struck me when I heard that, that that's what it means to the core that Black Lives Matter, because I think uh, what we should be looking at is, uh, you know, really taking, um, you know, a look inside and really uh, we're all people and, uh, you know, uh, Black Lives do matter when you really look at that context and that's not always been the case where you have this preconceived notion. And how do you um, uh, make sure that doesn't perpetuate in, you know, police department, fire department, city government, uh, in the community? How do you uh, eliminate that where they really feel that black lives do matter from that context? That's one aspect. And then the blue line, if you address that as well. Well, for the blue line, obviously, our goal is to educate people on what the thin blue line flag is and what the thin blue line and the history of that. And we've been kind of doing a little listening tour over the last week, talking to different members of the community. This kind of got brought up when we were doing our monthly meeting with uh, BLM here a couple of weeks ago and when somebody brought up and said, hey, it's our understanding that there's uh, some Blue Lives Matter stickers on your vehicles. And so we asked for them to send those to those because I asked, were they specifically talking about the thin blue line flag or what were they talking about? And they were like, no, it was Blue Lives Matter stickers. So we did a quick inventory of our vehicles and there were no Blue Lives Matter stickers on our vehicles. Uh, there are thin blue line flags that were authorized uh, and have been authorized, but also, you know, there were some crosses and some other things that were on there with the blue line imagery on it. So we have reinforced our policy that you had to have permission to put something on your car. The crosses and those have been removed. 
uh, due to the separation of church and state, uh, we still have authorized the thinly lying flags. And our goal is to educate people on what that means. Uh, and I think AC Scarlett did a great job a couple weeks ago at the committee meeting talking about that. And, uh, you know, again, if we're going to bring our community together, we got to talk about our differences and education. It's so important, like you just talked about education. You know, if there would have been a Blue Lives Matter sticker on there, we would have taken it down because I understand that that came about in retaliation after the Black Lives Matter movement. But I can tell you that the thin blue line flag has been around since 9-11. After 9-11, there's also a red line flag for fire department and EMS. There's also a yellow line flag for dispatchers and so forth and a green line flag. There's different things out there. And that imagery is woven into our, our profession as a sense of pride that represents our department, represents our mourning for fallen officers, that represents uh, different things that we do in this profession. And uh, again, I don't want to get into it too deep here because we're still talking to people. We don't want to be insensitive. We want to hear those things, but we also want to educate people on what it really means. Uh, so again, what happened in Charlottesville and what happened in DC, well, to be honest, we're ticked off about it. You know, somebody has taken and did a, in my opinion, a criminal act while holding that flag. Okay. Uh, what their background was, I have no idea. But it, it's not a, it's not an image that we enjoy. But again, I'm not in the um, business of letting the few people who want to hijack something and do it wrongfully as being something a reason why we should do away with something that means a lot to our officers and to our profession. And so I've had a lot of those conversations in the community. I was aware of an article that was posted on a local bloggers uh, website. Read all the comments over the over the weekend. And, it, really, there's a need for education is what there really needs to be. And we got to figure out how we're going to do that. And I uh, have some meetings coming up with some stakeholders to kind of figure out what that plan will be going forward to do that community education. But, uh, you know, we're upset, too. It does not represent white supremacists. It does not represent extremists. Uh, you know, as I told somebody yesterday, you know, do you think all the yard signs that you go down the street and you see with the we support law enforcement with the blue line flag on it do you think those people are extremists or supremacists i don't think so i think there's a lot of good people in our community who support law enforcement and i support law enforcement proudly do and uh or i wouldn't be in this profession and so again i think there's an educational component that needs to be done i support black lives matter uh there's just as so many black lives matter yard signs out there as well i don't think this is an issue we want to divide our community over I think this is an educational chance for all of us to sit down, have those hard conversations to come to some understanding, but we can't just dismiss it either. We have to be sensitive to it and we have to talk to people and figure out why they feel that way. But the two reasons I've heard so far who people who have an issue is because of what I said about Charlottesville and DC and, you know, wrong, wish they wouldn't have done it. I believe anybody who was involved in those crimes should be held accountable for their actions. Anybody who was involved in the insurrection should be held accountable. Uh, but there was a heck of a lot more American flags out there. And are we going to do away with our American flag? Of course not. Again, we have to come together and we have to hold those few people who are out there doing uh, stupid stuff accountable for their actions. So not to be, be, beat it anymore, but that's kind of how we feel about it at the Springfield Police Department right now. I appreciate those uh, comments. And um Really what it comes down to, I know <clears throat> a lot of times when you mention the national, that's a part of a larger scale movement, if you will. And uh, how we try to do things is, uh, you know, we're the home of Abraham Lincoln. And uh, we look at how do we, we're not going to be part of a movement. We're going to uh, lead the way in how we, as the chief said, uh, bring our community together. And really that comes back to uh, that compassion and understanding and uh, really um, talking to one another and uh, taking the appropriate actions necessary so we can move forward as one. So uh, we appreciate it. And you've done a great job with uh, regards to outreach. Uh, of course, it's not, uh, you haven't reached the goal you want yet, but you have uh, diversified our police department through outreach efforts. And it's uh, something you have to continually work at. And uh, I know uh, one of the areas that has been brought up, uh, Alderwoman Turner brings it up, which we really appreciate city council members, uh, whether it's pensions, uh, Alderman McMinimum will bring it up, or uh, having greater diversity where Alderman Turner will bring it up, or whatever the case may be, uh, we appreciate those comments because it, it keeps it in the forefront and uh, challenges us to work for a better solution. And 
uh, one of those areas, of course, was with the fire department uh, during the budget discussion. And uh, Chief Blau, I'd, if you add to the conversation as far as uh, diversification, um, you know, as we move forward with the fire department, what are some of the ways uh, you think uh, we can help diversify, maybe just not the fire department, but, uh, you know, the city in general uh, with regards to um, uh, better representation of our community? Sure. One of the one of the things that I've always said is we want the fire department to look like the community that we serve. Um, and right now, uh, we're not there yet. Uh, unfortunately, the way that it works, it, it, it sometimes takes a, a long time and to do it correctly, you need to lay the groundwork. It's, it's planting a seed and, and waiting for that seed to grow. Uh, and, and that is no better illustrated than what our plan to once once the COVID is is a thing of the past and we're able to get back into schools. I, I think that the the most important place that we can start is with uh, kids at the elementary school level. Um, if you go to a person who's 25 years old and it's a person of color and you're trying to convince them to be a fireman and they don't know anything about the fire service, then a lot of times that, that's going to be a tough person to convince. Um, but if you introduce the, the fire service uh, to, to kids when they're in grade school then, and get them excited about it and show them that this is a career uh, that is a, a path for them that would be great for them, it's, it's a wonderful career. You know, the, the public service aspect of it is, is fantastic. Um, you know, it's one of those things where uh, you, you get out of it everything that you put into it. You know, we, I can't tell you, you know, how good that you feel when you're able to go into a, a, a medical condition and you make that person better, or you're, you're able to uh, save someone's home and, and everything that they've accumulated over their lives. Uh, or uh, every once in a while, you know, we, we, we pull somebody's pet out of a fire. And, and that sounds like something that's not a big deal, but it's a really big deal to the person that whose pet that is. Um, but there's a lot of rewards to it. And if you can get those rewards and, and, and show, show these, these young kids that, uh, hey, this is a great, a great profession to go into. Uh, and then they are excited about that as they grow up and that they have uh, the ability to, to start to uh, figure out how they can get that done. That's, that's how you, you do a sustainable uh, level of, of numbers that, that reflect what your community looks like. Uh, just trying to run out and catch as many college age and 20 year old people as you can is, is a difficult way to get there. Um, so we're gonna try to, to do the, the long game uh, and, and get into to see some kids and, and make them excited about the fire service. We're still gonna recruit you know, at the high school and, and one, of, one of my job interviews for one of the staff chiefs uh, we had a guy who came in that, that had a great idea um, and we're to try and implement that as well. He's a coach as well in town. And he said, I go to some of the smaller schools and talk to the coaches as far as the, at the college level, the division three people who aren't going to be playing in the NBA. They're probably not going to be drafted uh, to play for the, for the Cardinals. Uh, they already have that team mindset and, and we're very team based. So uh, as far as, as, as the here and now, that's, that's a place to go and try and, and recruit some people uh, for, for now. But, but I still think that laying that groundwork, getting into the, the, the minorities, communities, and, and their groups and their clubs, especially Boys and Girls Club and a lot of organizations that uh, Alderwoman Turner has, has talked to me about, um, I think that's the way, uh, you know, as far as a long-term solution, that's how you got to do it. Yeah, it's, uh, as you said, it's like planting a seed and cultivating it and watching it grow. And no doubt we have to uh, get uh, to our young children uh, early on and um, have them model the behavior we all want and be productive in their lives. And I think that has a, you know, a domino impact, just not only on their lives, but other people's lives and our community. So we appreciate both of you being here. I think uh, people can tell by our discussion that uh, we're in good hands capable hands with uh, Chief Winslow, the head of the Springfield uh, Police Department, and Chief Blau, the head of the Fire Department. And we really appreciate the service that both your departments, the men and women of both departments provide our citizenry each and every day. Next week, we're efforting to have um, on uh, Wednesday again at noon, on February 10th, it'd be, uh, hopefully we'll have uh, public health here or some uh, medical professionals talking about vaccinations and 
uh, some of the things happening with the pandemic in that vein. But until then, uh, you know, treat each other with respect, uh, compassion, and understanding. And let's always make uh, today better than yesterday and tomorrow better than today. So until next week, we'll see you then. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.